really good chat. I'm really excited to have uh, Ryan King here with Comcast. Uh, this is a big news week for uh, OpenStack with uh, Comcast uh, coming on board. And I think this is one of the to few talks that was like actually referenced in uh, news media this week because they were looking for indicators about uh, Comcast being involved. So uh, it's also very cool that we're going to have some fresh newly released open source. So I'll pass it over to uh, further introduce the topic. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Ryan King, um, and we're here today to talk about uh, a project that we call CMD, uh, which is an open source alternative for queuing and notification systems. And, and really, this talk is for anyone who's uh, considering whether OpenStack is, is missing um, components in this area, and, and in which case, what we've built might make sense to integrate with OpenStack. Um, or anyone who's building applications on top of OpenStack um, and looking for uh, something to complete the offering that somebody like a a AWS has. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm, uh, we're from Comcast Silicon Valley. Um, we're a, a small team up in Northern California um, that has built and, and now we've open sourced this project. So I'm gonna just mainly talk through what it is that we've built, um, how it works, uh, give a little bit of insight into how we're using it at, at Comcast and uh, then field any, any questions that you guys have. Um, so really this is about uh, uh, giving information to you guys, getting feedback from, from the community. Um, and so, so for those of you who are expecting to see Matthew Perry up today, since he plays the character Ryan King in the TV show Go On, sorry to disappoint you, uh, I'm, not, I'm not him. <laughs> uh, and, and what I am is a, a head of technology unit uh, for Comcast Silicon Valley, although uh, some of my team is here today, as we'll tell you, uh, you know, they do all the work and I just stand up here and take the credit. So. That's how I think of myself, but really, uh, that's probably not how they think of me. Probably not so many tools in my toolbox. Um, and so, a summary of, of the talk here today is our team inside of Comcast has built and open sourced a compatible version of Amazon's simple notification service and simple queuing service on top of Cassandra and Redis, which are obviously two existing open source projects. So, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so who are we? Uh, we're actually a small startup that was gobbled up by Comcast a couple years ago. Uh, we build consumer-facing internet products uh, for the company, uh, mostly on web, mobile, and a little bit on, on TV. Uh, I'll show you a little bit towards the end of the presentation uh, some of the work that we've done, uh, which is powered by uh, the system that we've built. Um, and so let's, let's talk about it. Uh, you know, I, I talked about it as CMB. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, CMB stands for originally Comcast Message Bus, but now that it's open source, you guys are Welcome to call it the Cassandra message bus. Um, and it really is composed of two parts, uh, a queue service, which is modeled after SQS that we call CQS, and a notification service, again, modeled after SNS that we call CNS. So I'm gonna talk about uh, in detail about these two parts. Um, now, you may be asking yourself, wait a minute, why did you guys build your own? Um, isn't there stuff already out there? Uh, and I thought this graphic was particularly suitable for this, this crowd here today. Um, <laughs> Uh, given that that's what OpenStack does. Um, <laughs> and so I'll talk through some of the reasons why we decided to, to build our own rather than using something that's, that's out there already. Um, and so as you may know, some of the announcements in, in the last few days, um, Comcast is actually working on building out its own private cloud, of course, using the OpenStack. A few of my colleagues are here working on that, that effort. Um, and uh, th this, this internal private cloud is gonna be powering all of our next generation services, including our next generation TV platform, which has already started to roll out, which we call X1. I'll get into a little bit more details of, of what that looks like and how that works uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, and for us, uh, latency is extremely important. Um, you know, every millisecond counts for us. Uh, as you can imagine, if you're powering a TV service and every click on the remote is going out to a service in the cloud, you don't really feel like waiting 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds to go out to something like Amazon or, or so we're really trying to optimize extremely for, for latency. Um, and of course, it has to be cost effective for us and at a scale that we run and with an offer this service, we're talking about tens of millions easily of probably per season. And so we did take a look at what else was out there. There are various queuing systems, message delivery systems. Here are some on this board that we, that we took a look at. Um, but unfortunately, none of those really could meet any of our requirements. So I'll talk about why a bit later today. Uh, the requirements that we had primarily were we wanted compatibility with, with Amazon for a couple of different reasons. Um, number one, 
Uh, it gives us the ability to do elastic public-private hybrids if we need to. Um, but num number two, it also, we kind of like the, the model that it forces applications to be built into. Um, some of the, the trade-offs of availability versus, um, versus robustness are, we think are the right ones and the right model for how to build applications. So we sort of like to model our stuff um, after that uh, or, or up the stack. Um, uh, and, and one really big important r requirement for us that we found the most trouble with something existing already needing was sort of a hot, hot, um, you know, active, active, multi-data center situation. And so we really want extremely high availability, um, you know, with some of these queuing and notification systems that are in the cloud today, for example, with Amazon, they have availability zones and you can put a message in a queue in one availability zone, but it's not accessible without availability zone slash data center, you know, bombs. Um, so we actually, we want to sort of up raise the bar on, in terms of availability on that. Um, of course, we need horizontal scalability, so if we need more messages per second through the queue, if we need more notifications delivered per second, we just want to be able to add more nodes without changing anything else about the architecture. Um, specifically for our notification system, we need guaranteed at least once delivery. Um, and this is what, uh, what many of these other things provide. Um, it's an important requirement for us. Uh, we're not going as far as saying exactly once delivery, um, and that's, that's pretty important too. That, that trade-off is pretty important in terms of the, the ability to have it be extremely available and highly scalable. And as I mentioned before, extremely, extremely low latency, and we're probably talking about, you know, we like 10 millisecond response times in the average case and worst case of 90 or 100. That's kind of what, when, when I talk about really low latency, that's sort of what we're talking about. And so some things that, that weren't requirements for us um, that we took into consideration or didn't take into consideration were uh, number two, duplicate message can happen. And number one, order is not guaranteed. These two things are both in agreement for us. Um, <laughs> uh, and of course, this is, this is the same, these non-requirements are also true of, of Amazon and AWS. So they don't absolutely guarantee that the messages you put in a queue will be delivered, will be taken out of the queue in the same order. Um, and, and neither does our system. So let's dive in and talk a little bit about the queue service, how it works. Uh, so let me first start off, hopefully everyone's familiar with Amazon's simple queue service. Uh, my, my, the PR folks at my company made me take out as, as much as possible references to, to that company in Seattle. So uh, <laughs> we'll just say from a popular cloud service provider in, in Seattle. Um, the, the simple queue service offers a reliable, highly scalable hosted queue for storing messages as they travel back and forth between computers. So that's what the simple queue service is. Um, as you can see from this diagram, it is really that simple. There's queues that live in the cloud. Uh, there's producers that put items into the queue and, and queue makes everything back to cloud. Um, and the main methods that are involved in the queue service are, there's a whole bunch of methods, but the ones we care most about for the purposes of today's discussion are creating a queue, sending a message to the queue, receiving a message the, from the queue, which actually uh, just gets a copy of it and marks it as invisible in the queue, and then deleting a message, which actually removes it from the queue. Those are the main main methods of the queue service. And then now let's talk about our implementation. Uh, and so as I mentioned in the beginning, our implementation is built off of Cassandra and Redis. Uh, so we have a set of API servers which handles the, handle those API requests for create queues and send message and delete message and receive message and so forth. Um, and all of the data in the queue is actually persisted to Cassandra and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about how that's done in a second. And then Redis essentially functions like a cache um, to get the sort of latency that we like. Um, and I'll, I'll dive into that in a sec. Um, so first let's talk about what we're storing in Cassandra. Uh, and basically the way we've done it is each queue is sharded across a number of different rows in Cassandra. We've picked 100 as the default, but you can subsume that. Um, and the reasons that we do this are we like to avoid having really, really wide rows in Cassandra. So if you had you know, 500,000 items in the queue, we'd want to shard that across a bunch of different rows in Cassandra. That's tunable. Uh, reduces the, the churn of what's happening inside of Cassandra. So for those of you familiar with, familiar with uh, Cassandra and think about it in the context of a queue, a queue is sort of by definition transient data. So items put in the queue, written to the queue, hopefully pretty quickly read out of the queue, deleted from the queue. So there's a lot of items that get created and destroyed fairly quickly. And so there's a lot of churn that happens. Um, and by sharding over a bunch of different rows in Cassandra, we can help uh, reduce some of the negative effects of that, that churn. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, distributes, distributing over roads helps distribute the, the workload over the entire Cassandra ring uh, across all the nodes. So that's how we're storing data in Cassandra. Um, now let me talk about what Redis is for. Um, and so basically, Redis stores uh, basically all the metadata for the queue, all of the visibility data, and a, a cache of the queue data that's in Cassandra. Um, and so the message IDs are, are in a list, uh, the visibility information is in a hash table, and the, the payload cache is a simple set of uh, key value pairs. Um, so a couple of notes, and I'll talk about why we did things that way. Um, so under normal circumstances, when things are happy, we actually have pretty good, uh, we have very little duplicates being delivered in terms of getting the same item out of the queue more than once, um, and we generally have generally a FIFO queue. The reasons that we don't um, strictly adhere to order and no duplicates is because when things start going wrong, when nodes fail, when consumers fail, things like that, um, those, those restrictions would make potentially be violated. Um, and then we have seen that, uh, you know, even though we've done a lot to sort of minimize the effect of this churn that I talked about in Cassandra, that we will see some degradation in the performance over time. We just had to do a lot of tuning on our own uh, deployments of, of these services to get that to get that to happen. The good news is, of course, um, if you can tell from the architecture diagram that, let's back up a second, that uh, a, a basic receive message, which reads an item from the queue, is handled entirely from the Redis cache. So we can achieve the type of latency we want for that normal situation, uh, even when things are sort of going up. Um, so now the first, di this diagram talks about um, some of the performance characteristics of the queue service. So in this case, you can see along the y-axis is latency, so the, the time, uh, the response time of, of the receive message call. And the, and the x-axis is the throughput, so we're trying to drive as many messages per second through the queue. And so this particular example was done with 10 queues and two producers and two consumers uh, for each queue. Um, and so you can see as we move to the to the right of this chart, um, we're putting more pushing more and more messages per second through the queue, um, and all of this is done with a single um, API instance. Um, but you can see even as we get towards a thousand messages per second on a single instance, we're still, you know, in the, in the lower end cases to the left of the chart, we're below 10 milliseconds, and even in the we're pushing it really hard, um, we're sub 100 milliseconds, we're about at 80, and uh, we believe that you know we can add more. API nodes and simply scale this out so that that can keep going to the right without without too much problem. Uh, now let's talk about why we chose Cassandra um, versus there's lots of other storage systems we could have opted for, and some of the main reasons are the latency of writes, the throughput of writes, um, really the eventual consistency that we get across data centers. So we can put something in Cassandra, and eventually it will show up in another data center. So that if we lose entire data center, that item is still in the queue, it's still available uh, for other consumers. That's probably the biggest reason uh, why we chose it. There wasn't really a lot else out there that could give us the right throughput that we needed. Uh, maybe there are other eventual consistent systems, but this one uh, was the most robust that we needed. And then of course we can just keep adding nodes to Cassandra Ring um, uh, to make things scale how we want. And then of course the next question you might ask is, great, well what's wrong with just using Cassandra? Why, why, why add anything else to the picture? Um, and if you understand the way the queue service works, um, the, the message visibility, which is to say when I take a message off the queue, I mark it as invisible so no, no one else can see it, I, I process of it for a while, and then I delete it from the queue, that message visibility is often changing very frequently. So it's boom, invisible, boom, it's done out of the queue. Um, and it's not important that it be durable because if you lose the visibility data, that just means that someone else will pick up a duplicate, which as we said is actually well, not the norm is okay. Um, so taking this into consideration and also the consideration that we need really low latency reads, that's why we decided um, you know, we need an a, a in-memory cache that doesn't have to be durable and can basically trade off some durability in areas where we don't need it for uh, improved latency. And then of course, uh, I kept talking about churn in Cassandra, but basically by having the visibility data only live in memory, we're not having to do twice as many writes for the visibility. 
Now let's talk about the notification service. So that was the key service. Now we're going to talk about the notification service. Uh, and again, I'll talk about how, how our, our friends up in Seattle describe this. Uh, simple notification service is a web service that makes it easy to set up, operate, and send notifications in the cloud. Um, and basically, the way it works, uh, you can see here, um, it works as a set of topics, and publishers can publish message to topics. Subscribers subscribe to those topics, and whenever a message is published to a topic, a subscriber will receive that. You can have as many subscribers as you like on a given topic, and there is a variety of different methods for transmitting that information uh, to the subscriber, the most popular, of course, being the Voice UDP post, um, but you can do email and a, a host of other um, delivery mechanisms. Um, but just sort of for the purposes of this talk, you can think about it as HTTP posts and so forth and so forth. And so the main methods in the notification service are creating a topic, subscribers subscribing to a topic, and publishers publishing to a topic. topic. So it's that simple. Um, now let's talk about our implementation, which we call CNS. Um, and so this is the, this is the picture. Um, the most, this is a little bit complicated, but the most important thing about this picture to note is the, the entire thing is actually built off of CQS, so that's the system I just talked about. Um, so at the top, you can see those green bubbles are the consumers of the system, the publishers and the subscribers. Um, and we have a set of API servers which implement the methods that I described as well as others. Um, Cassandra is really just, in this case, storing the list of subscribers per topic, so it's actually pretty lightly used. Of course, it's used internally inside of the CQS um, cloud as well. Um, and then the rest of this, the way this works is when a message is published to a queue, or sorry, when a message is published to a topic, it's inserted into a queue, which says we need to deliver this message to this topic. Um, and this delivery producer figures out who's subscribed to this topic and then breaks, and there might be you know, 10,000 subscribers or some large number. So he breaks it into chunks, um, sort of fans it out, fans out the delivery for these uh, delivery consumers to go and actually do the HTTP post to all the subscribers. So this, this asynchronous system using the queue is essentially just to fan out the work and do as much of it in parallel as possible. So you have you know, lots and lots of consumers with lots of lots of delivery workers uh, sending these notifications out in parallel when one event is published to a topic. Um, the only other thing to note about this is we have these two different pools inside the delivery consumer. Um, really, the, the reason for that is we're trying to take into account that there may be timeouts, latency, errors happening on subscribers since we can't control them. And so we're trying to separate the efficient delivery of working notifications to working subscribers from the sort of problem children, which would sort of stick over here in the, in the delivery jail for a little while. So they have a separate pool of workers um, dedicated to the ones that have failed because we expect them to be uh, more problematic in terms of timeouts and taking longer time to send things out. So that's the basic picture of, of CNS, how it's implemented. Now let's talk a little bit about how this scales, uh, since obviously this is important to us. Um, and obviously for, if we want to increase the number of publish requests, well, it's very simple. We just add more API servers. Since all those guys have to do, they're completely stateless. All they have to do is receive a publish message, put it in a queue. That's it. Um, if we want to scale the number of subscribers for a topic, so we want to have 10,000, 20,000, and beyond, we simply just add more of these delivery producer workers, which are these um, background processes pulling things off of the, the queue and fanning them out. And then, of course, we can publish endpoints more quickly by having more of these delivery consumers um, that are doing more with more threads than these are just doing HTTP posts. And then overall, of course, to scale CNS, we have to scale primarily CQS, but also other infrastructure. So now some charts which describe um, how we think this scales. So the first chart talks about throughput scalability, y-axis being latency. And, and in this case, when we say latency, we mean the end-to-end -end latency of the time a publisher publishes a message to the topic to the time the last subscriber receives the notification. Um, so sort of talk about end to end. Uh, and and on the, along the x-axis is throughput, so just you know number of messages per second. Um, in this case, we used a single topic with 100 subscribers, um, and we were just seeing how adding more workers, seeing if we could back up my claim I just made that 
simply adding more workers will allow us to increase the throughput while keeping the latency low. And that's kind of what you can see uh, with what's highlighted there in green. Um, we've added more work, we've doubled the number of workers and are able to effectively double the throughput without keeping the latency fairly low. So the next topic is on scalability is some uh, performance results we've done to try to back up my claim that we can increase the number of subscribers in a topic in a scalable fashion. And, and similarly, we sh we're showing the difference between, in this case again, it's end-to-end -end latency on the y-axis and number of subscribers per topic on the, on the x-axis. And in this particular test, we just used uh, a constant rate of publishing five messages per second to a single topic and then just ratchet it up as you go right in the chart, the number of subscribers to that topic and, and see how uh, the matrices could handle it. And so you can obviously see as we get, uh, as we get start to get up in the number of subscribers to the topic with only three workers, our latency starts going way up. We can double the number of workers to six and get a lot farther before it starts going up. So in theory, we can just keep adding more workers and get lines that look um, flatter and flatter. All of this was done, by the way, all these performance tests were done with a pretty uh, wimpy eight node Cassandra ring underneath it. So obviously a lot of the, the performance characteristics have to do with the performance of that guy itself. Okay, um, now you, let me talk a little bit about, so we've built these systems. Um, let me talk a little bit about what we're using them for. Um, we obviously have plans to, since these are generic private cloud services of ours, we plan to use them for lots of different purposes. Um, but I'll talk about a couple of ones that we're already using them for in production to uh, give you a sense of the kinds of things that, that we might use them for. Um, and so the first one is um, our new X1 TV platform has this uh, cool app that our team in Silicon Valley built that we call the Sports App, and you can sort of see it on the, on the, the right side there. And really what it's meant for is the hardcore sports fan who maybe is watching one game and wants to keep track of one or a bunch of other games. And we're pushing updates to the scores and play by play in real time to everyone's TV. Um, so you can see, you know, is Kansas City in the red zone? Has the caster just passed, et cetera? Um, and so that's updating, that's just updating on the screen. The user's not doing anything, it's updating in real time. And so we use the notification system, the CMS, to take every time a, you know, a giant uh, make a score, the Niners make a, make a play. Uh, we push that out to all of the subscribers, which in this case are users, consumers who have this little um, side panel up on their screen. Uh, here's just a, another example of that where there's multiple games. So I might be into baseball and there's a bunch of games going on at once and I want to uh, I want to watch one main game but sort of keep track of the scores of other games. And in, in that case, it's just the scores that are updating in real time every time a team scores. Team uh, scores a, a run. So that's a little bit about how we're using it. Uh, mostly centered around the notification service, but as you can imagine, feeding in notifications are, are pretty important parts of just about anything you want to do in the company. Um, so, you know, why am I telling you about this? Why is this here? Well, we've open sourced this effort, so it's actually now on GitHub, so you guys are all welcome to check it out, contribute to it. <laughs> no. uh, and, uh, and we are really interested, I mean, the reason I'm here is to get feedback from the OpenStack community and, and other people want to use this or, or, or adopt it, that's, um, that's great for us. And then, you know, the questions I had that led me to this stage were, should this be part of OpenStack? Does it fit in somehow? Obviously, AWS has these services as part of it. Uh, OpenStack doesn't yet have anything like it, so there's sort of a hole there. Um, I wanted to get feedback from everyone in the part of the OpenStack community um, and figure out how to go from there. Um, as you probably saw, you know, we're, we're contest is now contributor to the OpenStack, and we're talking to various folks about uh, foundation status. We're in a close strategic partnership with Cisco to, to collaborate with them, helping us build our own private cloud uh, using OpenStack. Um, so we're really looking to get l a lot more involved in, in this community, and, and open sourcing this is sort of the first toe in the water uh, towards that direction. So th those are my slides. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to stand up and ask. Thank you. Over here first. It could, none of it's explicitly relying on this. I'm sorry? Oh, 
the question was, uh, is any of this relying on block storage from, from OpenStack? Um, no, all of this stuff is uh, application level code, so it's all, it's all Java code that's uh, relying on Cassandra. If you, if you decided you wanted to implement Cassandra with block level storage, then the answer would be yes, but it's essentially uh, our code doesn't store anything directly, it's using Cassandra as the database, if you will, the NoSQL database. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Multi-tenancy? Yeah, so the question was, have we thought about multi-tenancy? Um, I think, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was, um, you know, having it available in multiple data centers, right? So we have the, the availability requirement. Um, and we do plan to have, you know, the same sets of instances serving many different applications across many different data centers. It's a really good question, though, because we haven't, um, you know, we, we are, there's lots of good discussions about, okay, do we, stand up dedicated instances of CQS and CNS for applications so we understand the usage characteristics and stuff like that and compare it to scale, or do we just stand up one generic um, you know, cloud that we scale out across data centers and let everyone use it sort of for the model that, that Amazon is? So I, I don't think we've decided that. Um, certainly lots of arguments on both sides. <laughs> How large have you built it so far? How big have you gotten your clusters? Um, so far, like I said, we're, we're, we're in two data centers, each with eight node wings of Cassandra, with, you know, half dozen of the, the workers and stuff. And, and, you know, right now, the, the platform that I mentioned that I showed screenshots of is just in the process of being rolled out. So it's in Boston, it's in San Francisco. You know, we're in the tens of thousands of users range, but it's going to quickly scale up to millions. So the, the answer as of the moment is, Fairly small, but pretty quickly the answer will be fairly big. Um, how many messages, are, what's our peak messages per second? Um, you know, we probably have some thousands, you know, per second right now. So it's, it's, it's you know, in the same range of parameters of what I described just one of that per minute. Uh, but, you know, we could easily imagine, you know, one of the other use cases we're using this for is we do all the DVR scheduling in the cloud. So we sort of think about these crazy use cases where a TV ad comes on that says, hey, record American Idol tonight, push the record button. And, you know, you get 20 million people clicking record <laughs> right then. What do you do? You know, so that's sort of a, a great um, extreme stress case for the queue, right? So you put the fact that this user wants to record American Idol in the queue, schedule it all in the cloud, look for your app, and you could have, you know, 20 million come in, in in a very short period of time. So that's kind of what we're thinking about designing for, but we're, we're not at the scale deployed yet, but we will be soon. The question was, does it support auto scaling? Um, we haven't, we've, we've just built the services themselves and open source it, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to open source it is because we haven't built a lot of the management and operational tools around it. Um, and that's exactly what we think folks in the OpenStack community are, are fantastic at. You know, how do you, how do you build in a lot of the, that, that automatic stuff? So we've really just built it as a, as a service and starting to deploy it and realizing that we need a lot more rigor around tools and stuff like that. It's definitely where we're going next. question. I hadn't even thought about that before. I don't know if you guys have an answer to that, but uh, we, we still use, we're using, you know, the, the, the version of OpenStack that we're collaborating with Cisco on for our own private cloud stuff. And so really this is, um, this is the first stab at, a, at a, a service that could go alongside that. Whether we'd use that internally for how the OpenStack commu components communicate to each other, I, the answer is yeah, it's possible, but we haven't, haven't thought about it. the architecture diagram, uh, the Q service.
So the question was, how, what are we representing when we have these multiple layers of Redis? We really just represent straight, straight up sharding. So we have a bunch of shards of, of Redis. Um, right now we're putting, it's just a, a straight uh, you know, sharding off of hash of the queue name, um, or queue ID. Um, we haven't separated, but you could imagine sharding it also sort of uh, horizontally where, where we, or I guess vertically, where we keep the metadata caches separate from the data caches. We haven't done that yet, but so it's, it's literally, you know, if you have um, a single queue only right now be on a single Redis instance, so we're sort of sharding it by that gives you a thousand keys you can spread out among among many Redis instances. So that's something we thought about. Uh -huh. Yeah, and and we're not you know we're not explicitly trying again the let me back up a couple more which is the entire system actually operates if Redis is found. In a degraded state where we're returning a lot of duplicates and the order is all messed up and stuff like that, but it, it actually works and, and, and meets the hardest line of specification of how it's supposed to operate. And it's probably a lot slower and so forth. So it's really just a um, um, speed it up, speed things up in there. Okay, yeah, sure. I can introduce you to my half team build team. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, so we, I actually only, I explicitly simplified this to only talk about these. We've actually implemented the entire set. So change messages, all, all the, I just didn't want to go into details of every single one and put it all on the slides. Uh, the question was, um, do we have full compatibility with the latest version of the Amazon SQS spec? And the answer is yes. Um, just for simplicity, simplicity's sake, I only highlighted a few of the more interesting uh, methods uh, talked about that Jan has, has said about loading permits and that kind of stuff. Any other questions? Same thing with notification service. I highlighted a few, but, and there's, you know, probably 15 or 20 methods, um, most of which are more administrative. Yeah? Some features of our, t of our new TV service. <laughs> um, <laughs> people don't even know about that. I could give a whole talk about that, or actually my, my uh, colleague Brian over there in the back of the room could probably talk for two hours on that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's our next generation cloud TV service, so the most interesting thing about that being all of the logic is in on the server side, so we can A, make changes very, very rapidly in, in traditional cable set-top box TV systems. The UI is, I don't want to say this lightly, not very good and doesn't change very often, so <laughs> not going to piss off too many people. Um, <laughs> Uh, and with the, the cloud-based system that we've developed, w um, all the code that we run, all the code that we write that runs the screenshots I showed, as, whether, as well as the entire service, the guide, the DVR, uh, you know, everything is all rendered in the cloud and just displayed on your TV. So we can change it uh, every day if we wanted to. Um, probably won't, but <laughs> um, but we can certainly change it much more rapidly. Um, and the the thing that's connected to your TV is actually IP enabled in this new service, which seems like an obvious thing, but uh, hasn't been the case in the past, so there's, that opens up a whole bunch of capabilities. But um, from a, from a, to more directly answer your question, um, some of the new features that our new X1 service has, you should go and check out uh, contest.net slash X1. It can give you a quick overview of, of uh, what, what's in there, but and of course it has a guide and a DVR and some of the things you would expect, but it's, it's a complete replacement for the cable set top box TV service you would have in your house today. Um, and then has a whole bunch uh, more on top of that. We have iPhone apps that you can pair it with, which lets you use gesture to control your TV. We have apps on there, Facebook, Pandora, et cetera, so a whole bunch of stuff. Other questions? And it's a lot faster than any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Can't talk. Thanks, Ryan. I love, love seeing uh, open source projects uh, based on 
at scale uh, real use cases. So I'm really excited by Comcast contribution. So it's uh, lunchtime now, and I believe it's at the, the far end where the breakfast was. I think at uh, 1.15 there might be lightning talks in here. So uh, make sure you get your food in and then come back in here for the lightning talks, and then this track will continue in this room uh, thereafter.